All right, so we're here at WABC in New York with the legendary Paul Oakenfold. And Paul, it's such a pleasure to have you here uh, all the way from London, your hometown. But a lot of people don't know that you actually, in the 80s, spent a lot of time in this city. I did. So I'm sure all the listeners here in New York City want to hear, what was it like in the 80s in New York? What you like, what you didn't like? Tell them. I, uh, I lived here for a few years, actually. Um, wonderful time. I um, really learned a lot about not just New York, about America, the culture, uh, the way of life. It was the first place that I went to outside of the UK. And at that time, the music scene was really thriving here. Hip-hop was the big sound, and I really jumped into the music scene in a big way. Went to a bunch of the clubs. At a, at yeah, a you discovered it. DJ Jazzy Jeff, right? Well, I signed Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince in the UK, a song called Girls Ain't Nothing But Trouble, which became a big hit. And obviously we know that um, the Fresh Prince at that time, uh, Will Smith, um, him alongside Jazzy, were, were, were really good and they did really well in the UK and, of course, around the world. Yeah, you know, most people would call you the godfather of EDM, electronic dance music, and uh, your music has uh, been the background for so many great artists over so many decades. Um, you know, what, what gave you the inspiration to get into electronic music from the very beginning? I think it's, it's, it's quite a difficult question to, to answer, really, because... There's no place that you go to to get inspiration. It just comes. Um, and as a musician growing up, my father was in a band. I was playing instruments. And so I was around music from obviously a very young age. So I just kind of grew into it and found a sound that I liked, a sound that at the time was different. And it was very exciting for me. So I just... But you were in the early days when you used to call them raves and they were underground, somewhat illegal, like in yeah. Camden and places like that. Um, you know, that's unique that you were in that scene at such an early age. Yeah. Do you, know, you speak about so, that? So, yeah, I mean, that, those, those kind of places were, they were, you're right, they were underground, they were illegal, but it was exciting. And you were hearing music that you'd never hear on the radio. You couldn't go anywhere to find it apart from these places. So I would go to a record store. I found out where the DJs were buying the music. So I would go to that record store, start buying the, the tracks that they were playing and more. And then I started my own night, which went on to be very successful. And, um, and then it just grew from there, really. So do you feel that underground scene, that edginess inspired the music and was what made the sound, you know, what it is today? Oh, for sure. I mean, club culture, as we know it today... Uh, the birth really was 30 years ago when we, myself and a couple of colleagues, we started this movement. Yeah, it's an amazing movement. Yeah. I have to say that I'm a huge fan of EDM. And one of the great things about your genre is you don't have to make a love song. Um, yeah, exactly, yeah. And I, I have to think, one of the things about love songs, and if you make a great love song, that's great. But if you make a, a, a too good of a love song, most li likely it's going to be played in a public bathroom. Jesus. And that's just a weird place to listen to a love song. And I'm thinking, <laughs> every time I head into a public ba bathroom, for some reason, Ed Sheeran's playing. And really? how weird must it be for Ed Sheeran to walk in and, you know, have to use the bathroom while his own music is playing in the yeah, background? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that doesn't well, happen to you. No, not at all. You're pretty happy about that, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think Ed Sheeran's the king of love songs. Yeah, no, isn't he, right? Yeah. Oh, my gosh, the song. guy, I mean, he's... He's amazingly talented. Uh, I mean, I think That's he gave great. an amazing performance at Glastonbury, but a lot of people don't know this, but you were the first electronic uh, artist to uh, play Glastonbury to yeah. 90,000 people. Yeah, that's right. Um, and what a festival Glastonbury is. I mean, it's, I think it's Britain's number one if, and certainly one of the best in the world. And with my job, I travel all over the world and go to these unique festivals um, but I love going back to Glastonbury, actually. So was Glastonbury, as the original, like, mega festival, was that your inspiration to bring electronic uh, festivals to the States? Because that's another thing that yeah. you were revolutionary no, in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, America was slow when it came to, surprisingly enough, uh, it was slow when it came to 
the modern festival where you mix different sounds and cultures together. Um, typically in America, you listen to radio and there's a hip hop station, there's a rock station, a dance station. But as you know well, in the UK, for instance, Radio One, they play all kinds of music together. And I think that's what's wonderful about the UK is as we grow up, we're inspired and listening to many different forms of music. So when I came to America, it was really all about how can we do that and, and take it to the next level. Same with, with Las Vegas. I mean, when I started my residency in Vegas, um, which was a few years back now, there wasn't really wasn't anyone doing electronic music. And you, you see something, you saw, you know, and, what, and what that something was, was a gap in the market. And, and change came around, and, and now electronic music is huge in, in Las Vegas. So you, you spoke about the BBC, and, uh, you know, I think you touched around something very interesting to me. I've been living in the UK for the last seven years. I've noticed that uh, the Brits really get behind their, their music artists. It has such a rich history in, in music artists. I mean, some of the bands you collaborated that aren't as popular in the States but are legendary, like the Stone Roses yeah, uh, from Manchester. Yeah, yeah, they they were, you know, new wave in that genre. And then they just didn't cross the pond like so many other great artists like yourself, you know, like Elton John, like the Beatles, you know, mm. Led Zeppelin. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think they burnt out early. Um, I also think that they were coming up against the grunge rock uh, genre that was really, really popular in the right. States. And that kind of... <sighs> you know, shut out heavy metal a little bit. Like, I don't think the U.S. was, you know, they were more on to alternative rock. Right. And the radio stations at the time and the big record companies, they had more power over everything that's played. If the Stone Roses had gotten bigger 10 years later and you were the digital revolution, I think they would have expanded more through the festival scene and creating their own, you yeah. know, more of their own following where they wouldn't be beholden to, you know the radio stations or, or the record companies as much. It's a shame because there's some great music that comes out of the UK that never actually happens in America. Yeah, name some. Well, I mean, you, you, you just have the Stone Roses and the Happy Mondays. They were huge in, in Britain. I mean, they, they, they were having number one albums, selling out stadiums, and then when they came... And I remember especially the Happy Mondays because I produced the album in, in Los Angeles and... Band, you know, they, they, they couldn't get many shows. I mean, probably the arguably the biggest artist is Take That or Robbie Williams. I mean, right. they're not, they never really crossed over to America like they certainly did in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And Robbie Williams is still putting out hits. He's yeah. still very Just talented. Just put out a new album. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a, so last week I was in London for the uh, Soccer Aid event with UNICEF and Robbie. Uh, was was instrumental in putting that whole thing together. And what it was, it's a charity event where it's played in... Uh, it was Manchester United last year. It was this year. It was at Chelsea. It's the, the celebrities and football players, ex-football players, and they do this televised show, and it's UNICEF's biggest uh, event where this year they raised near to £7 million, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a wonderful event and a great number and, and good for them. You know, one of the differences I've noticed between American music and British artists um, is that you tend to get more uh, garage bands uh, in the U.S. that come out but maybe more not classically trained. And there's a lot of classically trained artists that in England and then switch over to more pop and rock and uh, so it was like an Adele. Um, you know, I'm a bigger fan of like Amy Winehouse. It's a little bit more gritty. She wasn't classically trained. Um, I know that you play a lot of instruments. Would you consider yourself classically trained? No, but you're, all. but you're, you obviously are super talented because how many instruments well, do you play? Well, I, 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 the piano, bass, and guitar. Yeah. Um, and you self taught yourself on all well, of that. Well, no, no, I didn't self. My father was a musician and my parents put me through uh, lessons. So I wouldn't say I'm self-taught. You learn, I mean, everything's about practice. So you, you, you do your piano lessons and then I would sit there and practice for hours as I would with, with DJ. And I, I self-taught myself to DJ because I like playing all kinds of music. 
back to you know what I said earlier with Radio One. It inspired me, and I, and I, at the time I was in a band and we were more into the rock sound, and I liked dance music. But at that time there wasn't dance rhythms with rock oriented kind of songs or guitars, and so I later on in life that's what I started to make. That's probably why I got asked to work with you too, or Rolling Stones, or Chili Peppers, or bands like this. Uh, in terms of remixing, because I liked both sounds and I could uh, work them. I figured out how it could work together. And that's how I got offered to produce the Happy Mondays and, and it went from there, really. Yeah, it, it's amazing how rich your career is and how successful you are. And one of the things that I'm most impressed about is from that success, you have decided to give back. You touched upon it. You're doing projects with UNICEF right now, um, you know, we're excited about honoring you over Art Basel yeah, on December 2nd and, and the Nobu Hotel with the World Hospitality Award. And, you know, that's based on two things, not only your charitable work and all that you do to give back, but it's also based on the fact that nobody brings more people together than you have. I mean, we talked about it, 80,000 yeah. people, 90,000 people is who comes out to hear you as the headliner. Yeah. Uh, and that's amazing. There's only a handful of artists in the world that's ever have been that can pull that off. Right. Um, what, tell, tell people a little bit about not just, you know, what inspires you to give back, but also what it's like to be, you know, on that kind of a stage. And is that the inspiration where you could see, look, if I can accomplish this, then anything can be accomplished. And that's what pushed you out, like artists like Bono, to go and try to change the world? Yeah, I, I, I mean, first of all, it's quite daunting when you walk out and you're on your own to that amount of people. There's nowhere really to hide um, and you and what you do is you you try and channel your energy through the music to the crowd um, otherwise you can kind of freeze and you're you're in the moment and and it's, it can be come difficult and when I played main stage at Coachella for instance the music that I the record the wind at the time I was playing vinyl, and the wind blew the record, need the needle off the record. And suddenly you've got 100,000 people in front of you, and there's no music, and the music cuts out. And you literally, how do you handle that? It was literally, my hands were in the air, and I was like, look, literally shit happens kind of thing. Um, and you deal with it, and you learn as you progress in anything you do, how to channel the the right things into your music and what you do. And, and for me, that's what it's all, always been about. Play the right tunes, get the crowd into it, and it becomes really exciting. And, and that gives you that motivation to change the world and your charitable yeah, work. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I played, uh, I want to say March of this year, um, April. In, I played for the Special Olympics anyway in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, Abu Dhabi and it was a real wonderful moment because where I, I performed during the show it was a big big show uh, televised around the world and I got chance to meet these athletes who've got special needs and how they and listen to them and how they've been training for this event uh, and it was wonderful to be a part of it and literally as in terms of my performance I wanted to try and play music and make people feel happy and joyful as these athletes were coming out. And it was, it was great because you could see how excited they were and backstage listening to them and talking to them. You find out how much dedication and work they put in to what they do. And mm -hmm. For me, that was very rewarding. So since we have a lot of New Yorkers out there listening to us right now, you know, we, I know you come here and play quite often. You've got a, a big event happening on July 27th, right? Um, Shemansky in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. And uh, touched upon it just briefly before the show. Uh, you know, talk about a little bit about what's going to happen at that show so people know what, they, what to expect when they come, if they've never seen you live it, before. It's, um, it's a late show. New York's always late, right? New York, New York City. Um, <laughs> So, no, I go on at 2, 2 till 5. Last time I played till 6. It's a, it, it's a great club with a wonderful sound system, first and foremost. And that's what you go to a nightclub for, to hear 
great music on a, on a great sound system. But what that club allows you to do, because it's so comfortable in terms of performance, is to play long sets. So musically, I usually play at one kind of genre, which is trance. But at that club, and because I play longer, it allows me to musically move it around. So I'll touch on three different styles of, of music, uh, music that I love and and enjoy and if there's any of the artists that are around on my record label I invite them down and they jump on the mic and sing sing along so it's a it's it's a great place and and how many times a year do you play in New York would you say four probably what's your favorite city to play in uh, Buenos Aires come on you had to say New York that was easy <laughs> we're talking yeah. to New Yorkers <laughs> Buenos Aires it is though at least we get New pure York. honesty from Paul Oakenfold Buenos Aires it is <laughs> sorry New York. he doesn't pander I to still, New Yorkers I love New York but <laughs> it's not my favorite city oh Buenos Aires it is that it is. Uh, just uh, that what, ma see, massive amount of people like is that the biggest because I see the concerts it's down not, there it's and, not and so it's much massive about, right yeah I mean it's not so much about the size mm. it's I think, I think, look, New York, London, cities like that have many, many people, whatever they do, go through those cities. In Buenos Aires, they don't. It's a long way away. So when you go to those kind of places, people are really thankful that you've come because you've made an effort. So they're really enthusiastic. And we all know that Latin people, when it comes to music, are... are you know, more They're enthusiastic when you come. I actually got held in customs in Buenos Aires. For what? I had too many stamps in my passport. But hey. I, I luckily I talked him into letting me in. Yeah, it was, hey. it, it was, it was tough. I mean, I, I had a U.S. passport, and then I, I had some extra pages given to me by the Germans, and I had a U.K. visa. And they said, no, it's no, you don't have the right documentation. I was like, no, 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 no. If anything, I have too much documentation. I've got some German papers. I've got some UK visa and a US passport, but they're kind of sticklers on that, that little stamp you get. And if you overstamp it, you got to get a new passport. Oh, and yeah, yeah, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in the back room of customs, but so far oh I've been God. able to, uh, I've been able to talk my way, <laughs> way uh, into the countries. So it's worked out for me. <laughs> Good. But like I said, they're happy when you get there, you get okay. to skip the line. The rest of us, we get the back room. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> there we go, right? All right. I think, do you want to add anything? No, I think we're ready. All right. Yourself. All right. We're back at WABC in New York, and we have Renee Willett, a uh, yeah, famous international actress based out of Los Angeles, but originally from New York, joining yeah. us with the legendary Paul Oakenfold. So, Renee, how's everything going? Great. I'm happy to be back home in New York. Last time I saw you was in Monaco. Mm -hmm. So it's, I feel like we're seeing each other in every, every part of the world now. Yeah, you won an <laughs> award, right? What was that award? Um, the Humanitarian Actress of the Year Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It, yeah, was, it, it was, was very special. well deserved. Yes. Thank you. And it's for your work with, for, for women's uh, rights, right? Um, it's a few things. Um, it's for mentally challenged children in the Middle East. Um, that's regarding a foundation called the Shalva Children's Center. Um, and their band uh, was one of the finalists in Eurovision. I, I don't know if you know Eurovision. Oh, yeah, I would yeah. watch some Eurovision. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the Israeli yeah. one with the quacking duck song. And <laughs> I forgot what song won this year. Uh, um, so, yeah, I do that, and I do um, a few things, like Alzheimer's Research, Prostate Cancer with Michael Milken, mm -hmm. a bunch of different um, foundations all over the world, depending on, you know, what I'm interested in. And uh, when I met you, I was uh, going to AMFAR, which is for AIDS. Um, a bunch of things. I think it's nice to be involved all over in all different facets. And th that's so nice of you to lend your uh, voice to to big causes. And we're so happy that you'll be joining us when Paul will be receiving his World Hospitality Award over Art Basel at the Nobu Hotel on December 2nd. Uh, and we're raising money for St. Jude's, so you're also helping us uh, support St. Jude's, which is a great cause yeah, as well. Yes, which huh? I'm excited about. Actually, my sister went... Uh, on site for St. Jude, so it's kind of a coincidence. So I'm excited to be involved in another beautiful foundation. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so where's your favorite place in, in the world to go? Um, I'd probably say London. 
Um, good, yeah. I, yeah. At you least you're pa- so. pandering to, to <laughs> half <laughs> of the room here. I, Apparently I nobody it. has love for New York. I love New York. I well, love it. you said to it. go. This doesn't yeah. count. I'm very happy to be home, as I said. But, yeah, I think London would be an ideal second place to be. <laughs> you go. Yeah, if, I, if another project comes about that's in London, I am taking it. <laughs> I would agree. I think London is my favorite city in Europe. It is? In Europe, I have to in your, in your qualify family. that. <laughs> yeah, I did, You know, in you the like States, it's tough. I, I, no, I love New York, and then and then South okay, Beach. Is, South Beach is up there on the list too. I was just like when we were uh, over F one in Monaco over the French Riviera. I was, you know, just thinking to myself, this it was. You know, in the nineteen fifties, that was the South Beach of that generation. Yeah, um, but South Beach is now Grace South Beach. Kelly and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that, now you see all of those people now in South Beach, like the, the, the you know, huge actors or in and in South America. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> and influencers exactly. of the world now it's like meet Columbia, in South Beach. Argentina. Yeah. Are we going back to Buenos Aires again? I can't talk about Buenos Aires because they don't let me through customs in Buenos Aires. No, they did. Thank you, Buenos Aires. For no, that. Thank I think you. All, I'm a city girl, so I, I really love London. I love, I was just in Tokyo for a month. I think Tokyo is a pretty incredible place. Yeah, I think. I, I do better in cities. That's my fault. <laughs> You're a city girl. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, I'm a city guy. I'm yeah. much more prefer cities. Yeah. Nah, I ride horses and fly fish. Yeah, that's yeah. why you're living in Bath. Uh, exactly, exactly. I, I like the Bath's country great. life. You should check out the hunt and fish Yeah, I'm a country lawyer. file, as they call it out there. A yeah. country file. A country file. Yeah, it's it's somebody that loves the country, like an Anglophile. Yeah. Uh, somebody who yeah, loves I Anglo-Saxon culture. I spent a, a month in Box, which is a small, tiny little place outside of Bath. Yeah, that's why and, I don't and know. I, and Peter Gabriel has a studio there, and that's where I recorded. Peter oh, Gabriel, so of course. Being creative, you know, yeah. you're yeah. in so your space. You, you that's that. it's, it's called a residential. So yeah. you go to, to some studio in the countryside. You don't actually see any of the countryside because you're just working this, yeah. all the time. But I, I, I used to enjoy going to Moles. Is Moles still Moles there? Moles is still there oh and still God. attracting Moles all the Bath. unis. Yep, exactly. That was the nightclub. And once a week we'd want to go out for a beer. Oh, so, so we'd that's drive your... this... 10 miles. Source of social. Yeah, time. and that was it. But I, I have to say, I mean, you can't beat a major city, as you were saying. I mean, I just prefer... I'm pretty sure this is the first time Moles has ever got a shout-out on <laughs> any radio station ever. Now I'm I have sure. to go. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to personally no, walk down there and we, say, we should go next time. Paul Okafold <laughs> has endorsed your club now on national radio, on ABC <laughs> national radio. That means a lot. <laughs> it's it's a stra- probably strange because... A lot of the artists who go and record at Peter Gabriel's studio, there is nowhere else to go. So you end up in right. this tiny little hole in the wall um, bar club called Moles. So I'm sure they've seen many, many people there that, that we're uh, not aware it's of. It's like the one. That's it's kind of like place. a mountain. I like to snowboard, so that's kind of how it works in the mountains. Like right. there's one spot in all the towns where everyone goes out, and you know if someone's going out, that's where they are. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> so, Renee, tell us also what's your favorite genre of music? My and favorite, since we are on the theme of honesty, no <laughs> pond pandering here, your favorite genre of music, maybe even throw an artist in there. Well, my favorite artist of all time is for sure Bob Marley. So I, I guess I would say reggae, but honestly, I think like rock and roll is my favorite genre. Classic or more hard rock or more Cla- metal? Not metal. Oh, Metallica is amazing, though, you have to say. Yeah, yeah, no, amazing. It's just not one of they my are. favorites. <laughs> and the fact that they stayed together and the fact they still can play live shows better than anybody, it's just I saw so talented. Live. Yeah. They're off the chart. Really? Yeah, they're really worth seeing. I but we care it. about what you have to say, too. But going <laughs> no, back to like Metallica. I, <laughs> I don't know. I like, so, like so the, the Who, the Bowie, who. you know, okay. Led Zeppelin, that kind of stuff. That's All right. Probably so my you're favorite. a classic rock. Yeah, that's probably band. my favorite genre. All right. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Paul? Uh, I, 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 I like Bob Marley very much so. And based on what I, what I said earlier, with uh, growing up in London, we hear all kinds of music. So 
I'm from Marvin Gaye to Earth, Wind and Fire to Run DMC yeah, to so many influences. You know, there's there's a lot there, and um, I I think it's it's um, it's important to listen to all kinds of music. That's where influences come and taste come. So rather than just one genre, if there was a band that either of you mentioned and I wasn't aware of them, I'd go and check them out for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, I feel like. That's I mean, I had the privilege of just being in Jamaica, uh, trying to raise awareness for more travel there because uh, as people are aware in in the Caribbean, there's been an outbreak of of crime and some some issues. So trying to support the islands, of course, and I got the privilege of of interviewing Jimmy Cliff. And a lot of people don't know that he still performs and he's completely with it. He has the same voice. I mean, he just belts it out. And he, like everybody at this table... (laughs) loves to give back. He loves his island of Jamaica. He's so passionate about it. So um, nice. And I think that that comes from that generation of reggae artists. Big music island. Yeah. I've never been to Jamaica. You have haven't? It? No, it's one Oh, you place. have to. Yeah, it's one. Beautiful waterfalls. Yeah, I'd love Great. to go there. All-inclusive hotels. Is it? <laughs> you should collaborate with Jimmy. There you go. I mean... It, 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 it's so many great artists of, in terms of reggae come out of, obviously, Jamaica. I yeah. mean, must be a lot of people there recording. I'm sure. If one thing came out of this... Sly and Robbie? ...event, it's Paul it's Oak and collaborating with Jimmy <laughs> Cliff. <laughs> All because of you, because you love <laughs> reggae. I, you I you want started A lot of people don't know this, but mention. Bob Marley. Yeah. I want at least five lines you, of the song. You've got <laughs> your special guest. <laughs> Bob Marley me. actually opened for Jimmy Cliff, and so did Jimmy, Jimmy Hendrix. Both of them really? open for Jimmy That's Cliff. That's cool. Yeah. Wow. Yep. I knew that. Jimmy Cliff said that he discovered Bob Marley, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. so cool. That's so How cool. did you meet him? So just trying to, you know, raise awareness for Jamaica and then did an interview uh, with him to talk about, you know, uh, what the island means to him. And uh, that was just about you know, promoting uh, tourism and uh, and getting people coming back to Jamaica. So, you know, with what's going on in the Dominican Republic right now and everything, um, we yeah, need to support those I- islands. Uh, yeah, they've, um, you know, had a, a, a rough Tough patch time, right yeah. now. Yeah. That's so. what I was thinking of my next partnership being out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. just, you know, just to raise awareness. Yeah, it's a great time to go. Yeah, I agree. It's a great time to go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other thing that Ready. came out of this. Exactly. Trip, our next vacation. <laughs> yes, we're off. <laughs> um, what else? <laughs> Delete it right now. You have to ask the question. Okay. Um, I have to ask a question? Yeah. It's time for you. We're switching interviewers here. Oh, you man. get to go. All right. Um, <laughs> let me think. Paul wants to ask the question. We'll come back to you. About what am I asking the question is about? You got to ask us a question. Okay, so tell me how you started your company. Tell uh, me about well, why, why, why the foundations, what makes, what moves you to want to do good things that you do in the company. Yeah, does. so I went to school for tech and hospitality at, at Cornell. So when uh, I saw there wasn't anybody doing online group travel right out of school, uh, me and a business partner just decided that that was a problem we wanted to tackle. And we luckily had, you know, very good success early on. So we only had to take a small angel round of funding, not like the more modern tech companies that do A, B, C, D round of funding. And by the time they're on their round D, uh, the entrepreneurs own nothing of the company and everything is owned by big private equity banks. So I'd like to think we're very unique in the fact that we're organic growth. Uh, we bought out our angel funders six years ago. We gave those shares to our employees. Um, so That's like good. in the genre of Silicon Valley, it was always talking about giving back. But, you know, some of it, I kind of question if it's if it's more rhetoric than, than actual deeds. I'd like to say that we actually, you know, did that by giving a true gift, you know, that's worth a lot and, and giving it to your employees, which the charity should, you know, or giving should start there first. Yeah. So, yeah, Good that's for you. It's nice combining yeah. your work, your passions with your passion for giving back. Like, I think that's what makes me feel like what I'm doing is worthwhile. How many charities are you involved in? A lot. I think I'd say 21. Wow. 
Yeah. Um, Good for this you. weekend, I was just asked to be on the board of the Gen X Alzheimer's Research Foundation. Gen X. <laughs> Gen X. Yeah, yeah, like so, it's like the young, younger people who are involved with helping for Alzheimer's and. My grandpa died of Alzheimer's, so I'm like, great, sign me up. <laughs> like, why not? It's yeah, another exactly, another yeah. thing to be involved in. And, you know, if I can parlay that with, I, I do comedy, so if I can bring some laughs to all the events and galas we have, like, why not? It helps raise money. Yeah, and for sure. The last one I did um, was at the Beverly Hilton in L.A. Okay. And it was me and Jay Leno, and we just did jokes all night, and we raised $5 million. By the way, at that event that we were at, and the host of the event invited you on stage, and then you, in your bio, you mentioned that you do stand-up, and she said, oh, and be funny. Oh, yeah. There's nothing worse than bringing somebody on and then calling them out on stage, right? Is there yeah, about she's to like, this is the, it's she's like, by the way, be funny, she's like, out loud to the entire crowd. Yeah, you can't so set up, like, you can't set up funny like that. I don't like know. I funny it was has to be funny. organic. It has to be natural. <laughs> I thought it you, I, I thought I thought I thought she she put you on the spot. I thought that was a little rough. I think she shouldn't have put me on the spot, but at the same time, I like being put on the spot. Okay. So yeah, that's yeah. what you do for a living. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a little weird. Just I it type up on way. a keyboard. Paul, you know, makes music and, and you entertain people. people. So exactly. you got to be ready to be I, on the spot. I've, I've got a question for you. So. When you when you do as a comedian go out there and it's just you on the stage with the crowd as it is with me and the crowd, but I'm hiding behind music. I'm playing music. You're there, and what happens if you try and out new jokes and no one laughs? Do you get heckled or you just um, go with it? Well, you definitely have to just go with it. There's there were some moments, of course, in my career where I thought I would get a laugh and I didn't, and yeah. it could definitely throw you off, but. I, I think I just, like, my personality is I live and breathe off it. I feel like I'm high when I'm on a stage, and I think your attitude and your persona kind of drives and fuels how right. the audience perceives you. So as long as you keep it up and, and you're not really, like, taken back by the lack of laughs on that last yeah. bit, it... It usually has always turned out fine. And your genre of, of comedy, is is it more political? Is no, it more... I like to say I'm the appropriate girl about inappropriate things. So oh. I'll never say something inappropriate, like Amy Schumer or Sarah Silverman. That's not really my style. But if I want to talk about something that is inappropriate, let's say like um, a night with a guy or like hashtag me too, I'll talk about it, but in a very like, quirky kind of way gotcha. so it kind of um it makes it all acceptable there's no uncomfortable nature it's which more, i like it's more like the pg-13 yeah it's version. like the pg-13 right. version. but do you have an r-rated version do you have a, a late <laughs> crowd version too i do i i honestly yeah. don't do it as much i do the i like the pg-13 version more because i just feel like that's my persona like i like to be more like cute than like dark <laughs> gotcha right. um and then all the events i do i have like an appropriate for grandma version where i do at all the galas right. because people all different people well almost every comedian does right yeah, you know, like seinfeld has, well, has, has two yeah. shows from what i've heard and seinfeld yeah. yeah everyone does especially if they are potentially getting hired for non-club events right which, corporate events corporate yeah. events which uh, we do quite a bit of exactly so now i know mm -hmm. that that you're suitable for all audiences. I am That's suitable good to know. for all audiences. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Paul is also suitable for all audiences. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> Tipper Gore did not put anything on your records, right? That's right. Because you don't have lyrics, so that yeah. helps. Because they only care about inappropriate words, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, for sure. So do you, do you try your jokes out on friends and stuff before? I actually try my jokes out on my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. Um, they have some great opinions, and then once I incorporate that, um, then I'll do it on my friends. Right. Um, I kind of have this whole shtick about um, like dating men of different ethnicities, so I try to I try to do it for my friends first. Who I'll make sure you know it's all different types of my friends. Right. Of all different there you go. colors of the rainbow. Make sure it works <laughs> for everyone. <laughs> I don't want it to go over negatively for any type of group of yeah, people. Yeah, of course, yeah. Which, with comedy, you really can't achieve that because most of it's, you know, harsh or political or, or whatever the word is. I don't even know. Whatever the word is. And so I'm, 
I'm really interested in like making being relatable to everyone. Yeah, it's an art to be yeah. able to make people laugh without offending. Exactly. You know, and that's that, that's nice. Not, you, you can, can offend that. yourself. I'm very self-deprecating, but that's like why you would laugh. You know. Right. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you'll have to I, come. I will. I, I think. It, I think. I think laughter starts with making fun of yourself, and 100%. when when you when you can do that and you're comfortable with it, uh, people sense that, and you know, and then you can crack jokes. Uh, I mean, some as as an Englishman living in America, I, I always remember because we have a, the English people have a good sense of humour, a specific. And, Sense of humor. Exactly. It's an English humor. Exactly. <laughs> and sometimes people in America don't get it. That's and true. And so you crack a joke and then you're like, oh, sugar, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah. Because they don't get it and, and you don't want to offend people. So by making fun of yourself, they can see that hopefully that you're not trying to make and fun of people. And making fun of your mates, which that... It yeah. took something getting used to for me that I was like, why are you so mean to this guy? You're supposed to be friends as an American. I'm like, that's offensive. Yeah, those... And then, of course, it took me, it's like, oh, you make fun of the people you like. You yeah, know? Exactly. That means you're friends. If you're not getting, you know, made fun of, by the, that means they don't really know you. You know, yeah. they're just like, you're... Yeah, it's, it's as you said, it's, a, it's a certain Every... sense of humor. Yeah. It's very English and we call it banter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I've heard of that word before. Yeah, banter, that word, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much the witty banter, though, right? We leave yeah, that for Steve, fast. please. Witty banter like, sounds witty. You know, you've got to come back at someone with a better line faster. Right. And... It's like always being on your toes. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I, I get it. I, I get it. I live it. Right. <laughs> That's why you love London, love right? That's <laughs> why you want to go to London. See, you like you like how I do, I brought that you around. Full circle. Always full circle. <laughs> That's because I'm a hospitable guy, you know. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. <laughs> so I think I think we're good. Uh, closing this out again. So. Closing it out. Yes. Do you guys want to add anything or no? No, no, no. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, and, uh, thank you for having me. It's good to be me. here. Thank you, Renee Willett, for uh, joining us. And thank you, of course, for the legendary Paul Oakenfold. Thank and you. we look forward to seeing you over Art Basel on December 2nd in South Beach. Thank you very much. <laughs>